So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes on uh, CD8 immunopets with zirconium-89 crefmalumab bedoxam. Uh, I've put my email address up on screen if anybody would like to contact me after the talk today. So first of all, a little bit about Imaginab. We're a radio pharmaceutical company developing targeted imaging and radiotherapy agents. We've, we've had five products advanced to the clinics to date with CD8 and PSMA targeted ligands. Our lead product is a zirconium-89 labeled minibody crefmalumab bedoxam, which is used for non-invasive pet emptying of CD8 cells. We're currently in phase two development. Our, our phase two A study closed to recruitment in November last year, and we're just starting up a, a phase two B study. Uh, so the, um, the background to this tracer is that, that there's lots of data out there in the literature to suggest CD8 T cells uh, are, are useful for predictive and prognostic um, as a predictive and prognostic biomarker in immunotherapy. So that's the reason for choosing CD8 cells as a target. And Imaginab has proprietary mini body and cyst diabody platform for rapid to clinic development of new radio pharmaceuticals. And we're now expanding our pipeline to, uh, to the development of preclinical radio pharmaceutical therapies. So before we get into CD8 immuno pets, I just wanted to, to give a, an overview of uh, the, the setting in the clinic today in terms of immunotherapy treatments. So uh, immunotherapy really is a new frontier in oncology. And uh, as we see new agents emerge, we, we see that when, when they initially um, emerge with very little data, they're, they're targeted at the metastatic relapse setting. And then uh, as more data is generated, they gradually move uh, closer to earlier stage disease. So um, they, they move into the metastatic first line settings and the adjuvant neoadjuvant settings, uh, and then um, further into lo more local disease and um, uh, earlier stage. So uh, we have at the moment eight FDA approved immune checkpoint inhibitors that targets both the CTLA-4 and PD-1, PD-R1 blockades. Um, Ipilimumab is, the, is a CTLA-4 agent, and then there are several PD-1, PD-R1 targeted agents. And these are approved in a broad range of cancers, including um, melanoma, renal cell, non-small cell lung cancer, epithelial cancers, gastric cancer. In, in February of 2022, there were almost 5,000 active clinical trials testing PD-1, pd one therapies uh, as both monotherapies or combinations. So this is a, almost a 300% increase in the last five years. So it goes to show that there's massive expansion in this area at the moment. Um, but unfortunately, despite the, uh, the immense explosion in the fields, there has been um, the, the response rates remain fairly low, uh, depending on which cancer type. The, there's an average of 15 to 20 percent uh, or 15 to 25 percent objective response rates, with the except, exception of melanoma, where we see up to 50 percent response rates. So with this in mind, um, the, the, there are a lot of patients that receive immune checkpoint inhibitors that don't have a good response to the treatment. And so there is a need for better ways to identify which patients are going to respond and which uh, would probably be better suited to non-immunotherapy treatments. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of results uh, that, that uh, support the use of CD8 T cells as a, a biomarker of response in, in immunotherapy treatment. So on the left here, we see a, a review article from uh, 2012, which looks at 124 published articles that compare the prognostic value of different immune cell infiltrates. And you can see in the first line there on the graph that out of uh, 58 out of the 60 articles 
that looked at CD8 positive T cells. Um, 58 of them that report that they have a, a good effect on the prognosis for the patient. And uh, those articles covered a, a broad range of cancers that I've highlighted there in bold. And, and if we look over to the right-hand side of the slide, uh, this is another paper by Tuma that came out in 2014 that looked at 46 metastatic melanoma patients. And the, the graphs here show the CD8 cell density from biopsy on the y-axis and on the x-axis, it's the time scale from baseline out to over 120 days after the start of treatment. And you can see in the top two graphs, which represents the, the responders group, that there was a markedly um, higher baseline CD8 levels compared to the non-responders, which are in the bottom two graphs. And as well as having uh, a, a difference in the baseline levels, there was also um, an increase in CD8 density on treatment, which, which actually correlated with the decre decrease in size of the tumor on radiographic, um, on conventional imaging. So, <clears throat> That, that's all biopsy data, but there are some uh, obvious drawbacks with biopsy. It's an invasive procedure. Um, you, with, with needle biopsy, you're taking a very small sample out of a tumor. Uh, it's difficult to, to repeat biopsy, certainly in, a, in the same part of the tumor. If you take several samples, um, then you might get uh, very widely differing results in terms of CD8 levels from different samples. So then you have to ask the question of um, so which of your samples is a true reflection of um, what, is, what is the current CD8 status of the tumor. And these uh, procedures are, are expensive and can lead to complications and adverse events as well. So the advantages of PET imaging are that it's a, it's a non-invasive procedure. We can image the whole body, not including not only the tumor, but uh, normal tissues and lymphoid organs. We can re perform re repeat imaging. We can provide quantitative data from di different tumors and different parts of the body. And it's a reliable diagnostic test. So Imaginab have developed Zucchenium 89 Crestmolema Bodoxan. It's a, an 80 kilodalton mini body with a high affinity for human CD8. It's small size allows fast clearance from the blood. It's immunologically inert, so its antibody effective functions have been removed. Uh, zirconium H9 half life of 78.4 hours allows repeat imaging out to seven days. And we have centralized manufacturing. Uh, which gives a six day shelf life for the product. We currently have manufacturing in Germany, the Netherlands, the US uh, and Australia. So actually the, the Kref Merlimab uh, part is the mini body itself and Bidoxam is, is the name given to the chelator, Deferoxamine. So here we see an image of um, typical biodistribution using the tracer. So you, you, can, uh, you can see the red lines, so normal immune organs. You've got the spleen, which tends to be very hot. We have a higher uptake in the bone marrow compared to um, normal non-immune tissues. And we can see that there's increased uptake in the lymph nodes. We also have some higher uptake in the liver and kidneys because uh, the tracer clears through um, the hepatobiliary and renal clearance. But we're, we're still able to um, identify malignancies in these organs because the uptake there is, while it's increased compared to non um, background and non lymphatic organs. It's, um, ten, it ten, we tend to still get higher uptake in tumors and metastases than we do in, in those organs. You can see here that there was a tumor in, in the leg, in the lower leg. 
So here are some images from our phase one study, which uh, we imaged 15 patients. I, I should say we, but it was led by Mike Farwell's group at UPenn. And um, so there were 15 subjects, nine male and six female, uh, with an age range of 31 to 82 years. And we see consistent kind of biodistribution across patients, which, which enables development of a typical pattern and identification of patient specific features. So I just want to draw your attention to a few of the features from these images. We see, first of all, in patient two, um, in, in the low leg there, that at the one hour time point, um, you can see tracer in the blood pool. Patient three here, if you look at their upper uh, cervical thoracic vertebral region, you can see that there's, a, there's a, no uptake there at all. And that's because this patient had received a bone marrow ablative radiation um, to that area. So the, the T cells have essentially been wiped out there. And then we, we see in the first subject uh, on the far left, this was a youngest subject and they had the most uh, dense CDH staining in the bone marrow. And uh, on the opposite scale there, we had uh, patient nine, who was the oldest in the cohort and had the lowest uh, uptake in the bone marrow uh, and also the clearest uh, in the bowel. So the long half-life of zirconium H9 allows for imaging over several days. We, we have here uh, a patient from, from the phase one study who's imaged out to six days. And we can pick out the, um, the tumors here in the liver. You can see the green arrows, they don't quite align properly, but th there are two tumors in the liver that are uh, clearly identifiable in all of these imaging time points. But we do see some differences in um, the bone marrow uptake from day one out to day six. So there's much more intense bone marrow uptake initially, which uh, gradually decreases uh, out to day six. And we also see um, the lymph nodes in day two, three, and six in, in the neck that aren't visible in the first day. So for that reason, uh, we tend to image at the 24 hours after the scan, um, 24 hours plus or minus three hours, so any time on the, the day after the scan, so that we don't miss any lymph nodes. So here are some examples of different tumor phenotypes that we're able to observe with CD8 immunopet. Uh, on the far left, you can see there was a, a melanoma patient that was treated with pembrolizumab. In the baseline, you can see that their tumor was immune excluded. Um, so there was high T cell uptake uh, on the periphery of the tumor, but these cells hadn't been able to penetrate into the core of the tumor. And then after one cycle of treatment with pembrolizumab, you can see that there was very intense uptake in the, in the tumor. And so we expect with a with scans like this, so that patient would respond very well to the treatment. And then uh, we have in the middle here, uh, an example of a, a cold tumor that was immunosuppressed at, at both baseline at, and uh, after treatment with nivolumab. And um, correspondingly, we, we expect there not to be a, a good response in this tumor because of the lack of amino activity there. On the far right, we see an example where we have lymph nodes where we have increased uptake after treatment with nivolumab, uh, signifying that there's been increased T cell activation in, in the lymph node. Here's an example of a melanoma patient who had a, a tumor in the right leg. And you can see uh, on the baseline CD8 PET imaging that um, there, there, there was a peripheral uptake of the tracer around the edge of the tumor. And then one month after treatment, there was a very intense uptake in the tumor. And we see from the CT measurements on follow-up, which were given in the, in the table there on the right-hand side, that 
after four months, there was a 35% reduction in the size of the tumor. And this, uh, this was predicted by the very intense uptake on CD8 PET scan early on in the treatment cycle. So CD8 immunopet can be used to predict uh, outcome to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And here's a, another example where we, where we have um, uptake on CD8 imaging, providing prognostic uh, insights into patient response. So we have a 71 year old man who had locally advanced stage three melanoma and he was treated with pembrolizumab. You see on the baseline FDG pad that there were two FDG average lesions in the left axilla. Um, imaging with CD8 immunopet four weeks after the start of treatment. So it's very intense uptake in, in both of those lesions. And then after an extended follow-up of 21 months, we see that there was uh, a complete response to the, to the therapy as predicted by the very intense uh, uptake there on the CD8 immunopet scan. So I just want to give an overview of the ways in which we can potentially use CD8 immunopet to provide information about the patient and also about the treatment. So with the baseline scan, we can uh, provide the CD8 status in the tumor and healthy tissues and lymphoid organs. We can describe the phenotype of different tumors as hot, cold, or, or immune excluded, for example. We, we can use the results of baseline scans for patient selection uh, and stratification based on their CD8 status. We can identify patients that may have had resistance to previous or, or ongoing immunotherapy treatments. And we can determine the, the treatment site for intratumoral therapy, choosing um, which part of the tumor should be targeted. With the on-treatment scan, we're, we're able to use data to optimize treatment regimens, uh, monotherapy versus combination choices. We can uh, optimize dosing regimens and routes of administration, identify patient subsets for uh, the inclusion into future trials, and we can establish very early on in treatment whether patients are, are going to be responders or non-responders based on the pattern of CD8 uptake. And when we take both of these time points together, the baseline and the on-treatment, and look at the, the difference, we can also um, use this to uh, make decisions, particularly around um, the, the treatment of the patient as well. So we can use the change from baseline to on treatment to help determine the optimal dose, to determine the drug activity in different parts of the body in different tumor types. We can confirm the mechanism of action and predict efficacy earlier than standard measures like conventional imaging. And um, we can establish patterns that predict clinical benefits. We can also uh, uh, enable early detection of immune-related adverse events. Typically, uh, how might you use the imaging data to make decisions about the patient treatment? So if the CD8 PET scan, um, assuming you have two scans at baseline and then an on-treatment scan after one or two cycles, you can use um, if, if you see a hot, very hot tumor, but there's no change in the size of the lesion on CT, or potentially a, a decreased size on the CT from baseline to on treatment, then that signifies that there's a, a, a good immune response within that tumor. And we suggest that you continue with the current treatment. If, however, you have uh, a CD8 pet cold tumor and, and there's no change in CT, but perhaps there is uh, some, some hot areas in the normal lymphoid tissue, uh, signifying that there is 
immuno activity in the patient that is perhaps just not infiltrating into the tumor, then you might uh, continue the current treatment and, and investigate the timing of that infiltration. If you have a, a hot tumor, but there's increase in size, then this could, could signify possible pseudo progression. And uh, you'd want to monitor the patient closely to see if uh, this is true progression or not. And you, you might consider uh, adding additional treatment or changing the treatment regimen. And if the tumor is cold and the CT shows an increased size, then uh, this really is a, a sign of progression there. And you probably want to halt the current regimen or, or try a different treatment or uh, combination. So I, I've really been focusing here, here on immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment because uh, that's where I imagine a phase two trial is currently uh, directing its focus uh, in patients who are, can receive immune checkpoint inhibitors as standard of care treatment. But there is a, a much broader um, range of applicability of CD8 immunopet. So we've had interest from investigators looking to use a tracer in radiotherapy trials with chemotherapy and with uh, laser, laser interstitial thermal therapy, which is a treatment used in, in glioma. We also know that uh, this could be very useful um, it, to image novel immunotherapies and to probe the mechan mechanism of action of novel treatments like cancer vaccines and oncoly oncolytic viruses and um, T cell receptor and CAR T cell therapies. We're also uh, looking at using this tracer to identify immune-related adverse events in patients that are, are already experiencing symptoms of adverse events. And uh, we're focusing on our phase 2B trial on uh, patients with colitis in particular to see if we can identify patterns in uptake there that could, could be predictive of colitis. Um, and then we also have non-oncology indications where CD8 immunopet can be useful. So uh, there was a five-patient proof of concept study in inclusion body myositis, which is an autoimmune condition. And uh, the study showed there was a statistically significant difference in the muscle uptake in the IBM patients compared with a, a control group of oncology patients. Uh, and we also have a couple of studies that are looking at COVID-19, <clears throat> both in patients uh, hospitalized and patients who have recovered from the virus to see difference in CD8 uptake between those groups. Uh, I'd just like to mention that Imagine I do have uh, an access scheme for investigator-initiated trials. So we'd like to support uh, studies using our tracer where investigators um, have ideas for the studies and would like doses to be provided. So uh, if this is the case, then we have a, a form to fill out that can be accessed through the Imagine Ab website. And also uh, you can reach out to myself directly by email and uh, we'll always be happy to consider your, your trial and providing doses um, for the right studies. So just as a summary then, CD8 immunopet allows non-invasive full body imaging of CD8 plus cell distribution. Imaging is possible up to six days post infusion with the radio tracer. Imaging before the start of treatment can help identify patients who are primed to respond. Imaging on treatment can shed light on the treatment mechanism of action and can help identify which patients have a strong early, early immune response. We can utilize CD8 immunopets in therapy trials to assist with decision making, which can potentially shorten timelines compared to standard methods of looking at a response. And we have the potential to improve clinical practice by aiding in treatment selection decisions. 
So it's a very exciting um, modality, and imagine I have uh, lots of trial activity at the moment, and it's something that we're very proud of. And if you have any questions about the presentation, I'd be happy to move into further discussion.